Hello students. Um, this is the first time you're actually seeing me do a live lecture. Up until now, I've been sort of just commentating over some PowerPoint videos. But moving forward, we will do a little bit more of this sort of live lecture format, if you will. So we have finished taxonomy and taxonomy to me is probably the least interesting part of this course. It's important because it's important that we know morphologically or physically what our various primates look like and their physical adaptations. Um, it helps inform us about evolution. So we know we started with our strepsirhini or our prosimians and we moved through the primate order all the way up to humans. So what you should have gathered is not how to memorize a lot of crazy Latin terms. Um, moving forward, things like Strepsirhini, Haplorhini might stick with us. We might use those, um, but much more our common names for our primates. We'll be talking about gorillas and Hamadryas baboons and capuchins. So, you know, we can leave a lot of that taxonomy behind. Um, it will pop up in our final exam. Um, but again, there's not going to be anything on the final that you guys haven't seen already in your taxonomy exam. Hint, hint. Okay. So it's the least interesting part because it's just really memorizing a lot of traits that they have in common and things like that. But again, it informs us as we move forward as to the why. So moving forward, and I did mention this in my last PowerPoint, we are going to become um, primate behavioral ecologists. So basically what that means is we're going to be looking at our primates as a whole spectrum of characteristics. So obviously their physical traits, but also their behavioral traits um, and their ecological setting. So one great example about how all of these tie together is let's look at our howler monkeys right? Howler monkeys have a diet of leaves. It's a very low nutrition food, very low energy food. So behaviorally, they are low energy. They do not have a specific adaptation to their diet like our colobines or colobus who have those ruminant stomachs. So they're not getting extra nutrients out of that food. It's a very low energy diet. They live up in the trees and they behave very sluggishly. The, the adaptation that they do have is those throat pouches, right? Because they're howler monkeys. So they're able to establish um, their territory without really having to be physical or move around a lot. They do it through vocal calling. So again, that's a great example about how their ecology and their physical characteristics and their behavior all tie together. So that's a lot of what we're going to be doing moving forward. The other thing that I will tell you guys is that I do have individual sort of thematics in those modules. So this module is about ecology. We're going to come back to it. So you might think that I'm repeating myself a lot. I really am. <laughs> I do repeat myself a lot because none of these things exist in a vacuum. They all do truly tie together. So we will stack, we will backtrack, we will, you know, pull things together. But as we move forward through the rest of the course, again, we're going to be repeating ourselves. We're going to be having new theories. We're going to backtrack. There's going to be a lot of that going on because they do all really tie together. So, um, Let's move on. <laughs> so the thing that we're going to talk about today is how ecology affects primates. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, territoriality. Um, we won't dive into dominance dynamics, like how a group sets up their dominance, um, until a little bit later. So we may touch a little bit on those subjects, but don't worry if I'm not fleshing them out right now because we will talk about them much more in depth later on. So the first thing I want you guys to know is that when we're talking about ecology, we're talking about a few different things that you guys need to be aware of. 
So you can see this large circle here. This is a home range. So a given primate, whether it's a solitary animal or a large group of chimpanzees, are going to have a home range. The home range is the area in which they may roam on any given day. Okay, so again, that's a large area that they may roam into on any given day. That is different from a territory. So you can see here, within that home range, there is this smaller area that we refer to as a territory. So the territory is what they're going to actively defend, okay? So they will move out of their territory. They may expand or change their territories, but the territory is part of a smaller part of the home range. Now, we might have another group of primates. I'm just gonna make a little quick drawing. So we'll say this is a second group of primates here. This is their territory, but you can see their home range may overlap with a neighboring group. Sometimes this can cause problems. <laughs> um, when we get into our chimpanzees, we'll talk about warfare and that they actually practice systematic warfare with neighboring groups to expand their territories. Um, some of our other primates like our howlers or our gibbons will typically not come to blows. So they may move into a home range and if they come close enough to another group, they will use the vocal duetting to sort of figure out location and move away. Um, but that territory is something they will defend and all of our primates will do that, whether they're solitary, um, whether they're polygamous, multi-male, multi-female, okay? They're going to have a core territory that they defend. So some of these things get a little complicated when we, so for example, start talking about baboons because baboon society is very complex. Um, so that's gonna kind of be in the next module. We'll talk about uh, <clears throat> societies, but today we're really talking about ecology. And I know I've been watching in the discussion, I know a lot of you said that you haven't really used your coloring book. So I don't really give many assignments per se out of the coloring book, but the coloring book does a beautiful job. And if you haven't been using it, I would 100% make sure that you go through and look at it because um, like, for example, when we started to talk about a college or, uh, taxonomy and classification, right? There's some beautiful examples in there of that. Um, let's see, what else is there? I know I was just peeking through this for you guys. So like here, here's our kingdom of primates. So again, this is going to have really great supplemental reading for you guys so that you can kind of take a deeper dive into understanding it. Um, here is a really great example of that um, depth perception and that binocular vision. Okay, so again, we're not gonna have a ton of, oh, see, this is great. This here, when we start talking about um, like life history and um, even uh, social structures and things like that. There's a great thing in here on tool use, um, prosimian ecology and separation, okay? So this is when we're talking about ecology, right? So an important thing to see here um, in something like this is like this book does a really great job of visually, what's the best way, okay? So this page here, I'm not sure, I have a very, very, very old copy of this. So this is section 4-5. Um, hopefully that aligns for you guys as well. But so this talks about pr prosimian ecology and niche separation, right? What does that mean? So an important thing for us to know is that the primates have developed their behavior and their physical characteristics based on their ecological niche. So what does that mean? So a really glaring example of a great ecological niche is our eye eye, right? He is a big old nocturnal primate that forages solitarily. So he lives 
on his own. And he's adapted a lot of physical characteristics to what his ecology and his niche is. He eats bugs that live in trees. So he's got that finger that he can knock on and dig those grubs out of the tree. He can hear very well. Um, he's the only guy who's going to do that, right? So he's got the market cornered on that niche, that nighttime grub hunter, <laughs> right? So they're all going to have an ecological niche because what you don't want is a lot of primates living in a single area that are going to compete for the same food source at the same time, okay? So a lot of our, um, like our potos and our galagos are going to be um, insectivores, right? So they're gonna eat insects, um, but they're also going to eat things like, so let's, let's look at this, their diet, okay? You can see right at the top of this page, it gives you diet, gums, fruits, insects, okay? And so you can see right below it, it's giving you the percents, okay? So if we look at our lorises and patos, they're going to eat a lot of gum or tree sap, right? 65% of their diet, okay? So if we look at our other guys here, we're gonna see that like our galagos is going to eat a lot of, what is he eating a lot of? What's H? Oh, H is insects, okay? I don't know why they didn't just call it I. Anyways, so our galago is gonna eat a lot of um, insects, right? So they're not gonna overlap, okay? So they may, these primates are all gonna live potentially in similar geographic regions, but you're not going to see those, um, those niches overlap very much in areas that we do see those niches overlap very much. So can you think of an animal that might have polyspecific, so many species of the same animal eating the same food source? I'll give you guys a second. You should remember this because it was just on your taxonomy exam. Okay, so marmosets and tamarins, right? What do they eat? They eat tree sap. That is a big part of their diet. So when we say that's what they eat, it's usually not their sole diet. Like they'll eat insects and other things, but they do spend a lot of their time eating tree sap. Is tree sap a resource that you have to defend? No, there's a lot of it. There's lots of trees. You don't need to defend the sap, right? because that would be a waste of energy. There's so much of it that it's not worth fighting about. So that's important for uh, when we're talking about how the primates work within their ecology. Okay, so our marmosets and tamarins do not have to defend their food source, right? It's abundant and it's easy to access. So, we're not going to see a ton of territoriality around a food source for them. But what will we see? What's a morphological change that's going to happen based on their ecology? Right? So this was one of your questions. This is that they're going to have very different peltage and, and like coat colors. And they're going to be really, really obvious to distinguish from each other. And that's important, right? Because... Physically, they're all pretty close to the same size. Um, you know, their body structures are very similar. Well, we don't want to mate if we're an emperor tamarin. We don't want to mate with a golden lion tamarin, right? Because we're a different species genetically. We're not going to have viable offspring, okay? So we need to be able to visually tell <laughs> who we should mate with, right? Or who we should woo as a potential mate, right? because we don't need to compete for a food source, we're all gonna be coming together. So physically, we need to look very different because it would be bad for us, right? To mate with um, another animal that couldn't produce a viable offspring, right? We would be wasting our genetic resources, okay? So that's important, that's part of the ecology. 
Um, there was another. So there's a whole section in here, and I don't know if it's all. So around, for me, I'm going to say 4-5, and I apologize if your book is a little different because I know I have a very old copy. There's, um, you know, we're talking about lemur ecology, right? And again, we have bamboo lemurs who are going to specialize in eating bamboo. And then we have our eye eye who's going to specialize in grubs. We have our, let's see, who's this guy? Ah, our rufted lemur who's going to eat flowers and nectar. Okay, so their ecolo ecological niches are going to be very different if they spend a lot of time in close geographic um, proximity. Um, because it's really important, again, that we're not competing for the same resources, right? We want to um, have variance. So that's why it's so important for us to understand the taxonomy, because the variance isn't just for the fun of it. Our variances from animals to animal or primate to primate is really based on the need to work with what you have within your niche. Um, sorry, I'm just skipping because there was another page that I wanted to show you guys and I lost it as I was flipping around. Um, and I'm not going to be able to find it now, but there's a few different sections in the coloring book that talk about ecological niches. So I think it's really important that with the coloring book that you guys know that this is a really great resource to back up everything that we're doing in class. Um, so you guys really should be using it, um, especially moving forward. Your Primates of the World book was really much more focused on the taxonomy section. Moving forward into behavior, we're going to be able to utilize this book a little bit more because there's a lot more behavior in there. So again, coming back to ecology. So we have ter um, territories and home ranges. And how territorial an animal is, is going to depend on how defendable their food resource is. So let's talk about a couple examples of defendable food resources, um, or if they're worth defending. So animals that eat a lot of fruit, chimpanzees, capuchins, squirrel monkeys, okay, they eat fruit. And fruit is going to be patchy. So let me get another piece of paper here. So if I am in my home range, just a second guys. Boop, 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 drawing some fruit. Okay, so let's say that these are patches of really high quality fruit trees, right? And this is my home range. Let's say that my territory includes these two patches, right? So fruit, the problem with fruit is it's seasonal, right? You can't get apples. We're in Buffalo, it's apple picking season, right? We're not gonna get apples in March. Apples are now. <laughs> So we want to get the fruit when it's the ripest, when it's the best, right? Because it's seasonal. So if we are able to defend a food resource, we're going to be much more territorial about that food resource, right? Because it's worth defending, okay? It's worth our energy, right? So if I am a capuchin monkey, and you guys probably saw the video of the capuchins, it's worth it for me to defend a food resource because it's high quality. It's going to give my group a lot of great energy, a lot of much needed food, and I don't want another group to come and get it. So it's worth the effort to go to battle to defend that food resource. If I'm a howler monkey and I eat a lot of leaves, am I defending a food resource? Is my territoriality based on um, anything ecological? No. I eat leaves. I don't need to defend them. 
is it worth my time and energy to keep another troop away from my leaves when every single tree in my rainforest has leaves that I can eat? No. So I'm not going to be territorial over a food resource. What I'm going to be territorial over are my group members, my females, my breeding females, right? Because they're a different resource. So we're only going to be territorial as a primate over two things, a defendable food resource or breeding females or access to breeding females. Those are the only two things worth fighting over. And at the end of the day, a male will go without eating if he can have sex. So <laughs> we're going to get more into that and more into that in the social structures. Um, but so that's important because when we start talking about social structures, we're going to have to start saying, okay, are they in this social structure because it benefits the group in terms of an ecological niche or does it benefit the group in terms of access to sex? Okay. Those are our two deciding factors in anything we do behaviorally food or sex. So ecology is based on food, right? Understanding our physical environment. So these guys are going to want to be very territorial over those high quality fruit trees. Now you see this little one here, this might be something that comes into um, like a, a, a squirmish, if you will, with a neighboring troop because it's close enough, right? So we don't know, I didn't draw, we're just gonna speculate where this other, the close next closest troop is. So this group may want to extend their territory um, to include this tree. This group may not want them to do that, right? It depends on where it is in relation to the other troops territory and how much of their territory and home ranges overlap. And in chimpanzees, we will see systematic warfare to claim land for your troop. So ecology is hugely important because it's going to dictate a lot of what we do. Are we going to do it based on our food needs? So more territorial animals are going to be things that have our food resources that are highly defendable. Okay. When we talk about dominance, we're also going to talk about that as well. Is my resource highly defendable? If it is, we're going to be much more stringent about our territoriality. Is my resource not defendable? Do I eat leaves? Do I eat insects? Right? Um, a lot of our insectivores, our little primates that eat insects, live in solitary social structures because they don't need to defend a territory. They hunt at night. Um, their niche doesn't require them to sort of work in groups. Um, leaves, again, I don't need to defend them, but a lot of our leaf eaters live in social groups. So when we talk about social groups, we're going to talk about why there's a benefit to live in a group if you eat leaves or why there's a benefit to be solitary if you eat insects. So when I say somebody eats insects, I'm talking about more than half of their diet sort of consisting of that. So like our Galagos and our IIs and things like that are going to eat a large portion of their diet is going to be insects. Our Capuchins are going to have a huge portion of their diet being fruit. That's going to be the largest portion, but they'll eat insects. They'll eat small mammals like lizards if they can get them. They'll eat nuts. Again, they're pretty like advantageous. So if they see something they can eat, they'll eat it. But again, the vast majority of their diet is going to be fruit. So that's our ecology. That's something that's really important, again, moving forward. And I, I know I keep saying that, but I want you guys to understand we're going to come back to this. I'm going to ask you to make those connections. Even at the end of the course, when we get into December and we talk about human behavior, we will talk about defense of ecological niches, okay? Because it even applies to human behaviors. Um, so even start thinking about that, like how do humans use their ecological niches? So humans are the most prolific primate, right? We live everywhere on the globe from as far north as the 
the tundras of like the North Pole. We're not really in Antarctica, but we live very far north, right? And we live in high mountains, we live in deserts, we live in tropical rainforests, we live near rivers, we live near oceans. How do humans utilize their niche? So let's even just think about Italy, right? Um, if you've ever been to Italy, um, everybody knows what Italy is, right? <laughs> I don't think there's anybody who I'm saying Italy. If I said Suriname, you might say, where the heck is that country? But if I say Italy, we can all picture it in our head. It's the little boot, right? Northern Italy. Their diet's going to consist of a lot of meat, pork, lamb, right? Much heavier red sauces, okay? If we look down into the lower part of Italy, right, the toe of the boot, it's poking out into the Mediterranean. It's going to be a much lighter diet. There's going to be a lot of um, fresh vegetables, a lot of seafood, right? So it's going to be a different kind of diet, right? A more Mediterranean diet. Then the northern part, right? The northern part's going to have a lot more dairy and cheese, right? Because they're going to have a lot more land to have like um, grazing stock, hoof stock, right? Where if you're on Sicily, there's not a lot of land. You're going to get a lot of your um, resources from the ocean. Now, obviously, with trade and all that, we know those things move back and forth. But, like, let's think about historically. So, ecological niches, right? You have to adapt to what's available to you. So, we think about our primates. We think about where they live, right? You're adapting to what's available to you. You're trying not to compete directly with very many other animals, right? Because you want to have as much of that research to yourself as possible. So again, yeah, take a look through this, okay? So I am going to give you sort of an assignment, even though I'm not collecting it. But go ahead and look through this and find the different areas in which they talk about the ecological niches. Um, so if you guys go to the beginning, you'll see how these chapters are all broken out. Okay, so we can do, um, let's see, where's, oh, look, primate ecology, home range territory, three, four. Ah, here's a great, better than my drawing. Okay. So, again, make sure you're taking a look at this and, and going through it because it helps to back up everything I'm saying. While I don't necessarily give you guys reading assignments, you do kind of need to read. Um, because we're online, it's a little bit more of a challenge that we don't have discussion. Um, one of the things I love about this class is that we do have a lot of discussion when we're together. And we'll flush a lot of these things out in class. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have that. Um, so I do suggest going through. And these are not terribly long reading assignments. I mean, that's going to take you like three minutes to read this and to see the picture. So definitely go through and look at that. Um, in terms of the discussion, let's talk about um, ecological niches. Let's talk about, um, you know what? Let's do this. I'm going to ask you to think of a society, a human society that has really taken advantage of their ecological niche. Okay. So that's going to be our discussion for this week. So really think about that. Think about an example of humans, a human population or human culture that is really truly like taken advantage of a unique ecological niche for their um, survival. So that's all I have for this. Um, it really is, the ecology part is really an introduction to what we're moving forward to do. Next module will be on um, social structures. So I'm actually holding back from saying a lot <laughs> because I don't wanna jump too far forward into social structures. So we'll revisit a lot of this and we, when we talk about social structures, we'll tie back to it, all right? So that's all I have for this module for ecology. I will see you guys in the discussion. As always, if you have a specific question, please email me and I will see you guys soon.